All right, so my name is Emma. Um, thanks for, for everybody that's here. I know it's you know right before Thanksgiving. Um, so today we're gonna talk about um, joint pain. Um, we're gonna have, we're gonna go back to our kind of mini case um, format where we, we're gonna do three cases today. Um, you know, similar format to what we did when we did dermatology cases. Um, we're going to focus on three. There's so many different causes of joint pain. I felt like I would be doing you guys a disservice if I only talked about one case because there's so many things to talk about. So we're going to talk about three cases, but no, this is not, you know, all inclusive, much like any other session with the, with the virtual rounds. So if you guys have questions or anything, feel free to, to ask them during the, the session, but certainly happy you guys are here. Um, happy I'm here. Um, and, and I found this meme and I had to add it, the one on the bottom, uh, the bottom right hand corner. I don't know if you guys are going to play any Cards Against Humanity this, uh, this weekend, but uh, we, we love playing that game. So I saw that uh, as a meme for joint pain and I had to uh, add it into my presentation. So let's, let's keep going here. Um, I'm going to launch this poll for you guys, you know, much as always, um, let me know what you guys, uh, where you're at in terms of, of your joint pain, uh, what you know about joint pain, whether it's, you know, you know, nothing or, you know, a lot or, or where you kind of lie on, on the, the poll here. And then we'll, we'll take it again at the end and, and see kind of if there's any, um, you know, change in, in, you know, your guys's progress. I think most of you guys are in ACL surgery. Oh, I haven't, I've had ACL surgery too. It's not, not fun. If, if you had the little machine that makes your knee go, I didn't love that. All right. I think most of you guys are in, um, there's six of you that are, are doing something, prepping your turkey simultaneously, but I'm going to end the poll for the sake of time. Let me share the results here. Um, so it looks like the most of you don't know a lot about joint pain. Um, so let's see if we can't change that to, you know, you guys knowing a little bit or, or knowing some. Um, there is a lot to know about joint pain. This, you know, as I kind of indicated, it's not going to be, you know, all inclusive, but hopefully we can teach you something uh, tonight and, and have some, some fun in the progress or in the process rather. All right, so like I talked about, um, there's going to be three cases today. We're going to do three kind of musculoskeletal cases. I'm going to ask you guys to read the cases. Um, so I'm going to ask three of you to read um, and, and ask questions if you have them. I guarantee there's somebody out there that has the same question. Um, and then fill out the soap note um, so you can get credit for this um, and, and fill out the quiz. The quiz is pretty easy. I think this is honestly one of the easiest quizzes I've, I've created for you guys. I wanted you to be able to get off this call, do the quiz in, in you know, five to 10 minutes tops, um, and then go enjoy your the rest of your week and your break. Um, so um, that quiz will be due by Tuesday of the next week, so right before the next session. Um, and it should be fairly simple. Um, and, and if you guys have any problems, always uh, feel free to, to reach out to, to me or, or anybody else um, about that. All right, let's keep going. So here's the soap note. Um, and, and it's, you know, very, very simple. If this is your first time, welcome. Um, we do have the soap note, um, Google note or Google uh, doc. Um, here's the link. I just put it in the chat. Um, it has, there's resources in that file. There's also the soap note template. Um, and SOAP is an acronym. It's, it's how we kind of write our notes. It's for subjective, objective, assessment, and plan. And uh, what we're going to do here in the subjective is we're going to place all the things that the patient tells us. So the history of present illness, the HPI, kind of that narrative about why they're presenting. And then the ROS, so things that are pertinent to their joint pain. So if we're talking about joint pain tonight, we might say pertinent positives are things like swelling, numbness, tingling, um, redness, uh, fevers, chills, things like that. Um, and and if, if they're positive, it's pertinent positive or pertinent negative, they're negative. Um, objective things are things like um, the vital signs um, in the physical exam, so things that we find objectively. The assessment is kind of our differential diagnosis. And then the plan is what we're going to do to treat um, that, what, what we suspect is going on or what we know is going on. All right, fairly simple. If you guys have questions about that, feel free to, um, to ask. So feel free for, for this session tonight to fill out 
for one of the cases. So if you want to do it for the first one and kind of kick your feet up and, and just uh, watch the rest, that's perfect. Um, though be sure there are questions on the quiz for from each case. Um, they are fairly simple. And then um, there was one other thing that I was going to tell you that I'm, I'm totally blinking on now. Um, oh yeah, if there's not um, you know extensive details, if I don't give you an extensive physical exam or extensive vital signs, you can you know go ahead and and you know. Uh, brainstorm or, or start to make those connections to what the vital signs would be or what the physical exam would be for that specific pathology, or just include the information that's in there. There's nobody that's going to look at these and say, you know, this is, you know, incomplete, not good, you're not going to get credit. This is for your practice. So the, the most information that you put in and really kind of practice writing out these notes, um, the, the, you know, more prepared um, you will be, you know, for medical school and, and having practice with this. So let's keep going. Um, and now, um, if you would like to go ahead and annotate where you're at um, tonight. Um, so if you go up to the top, you go to um, the annotate button. And then if you click a stamp or you can draw it in or whatever you want to do, um, go ahead and, and stamp. Stephanie is always so quick. Adam's also in, in uh, California, it looks like. We have some Texas. We always have lots of people on the, the East Coast, I think. Awesome. We have our somebody in Georgia. We, we usually have a lot of people from South Carolina, too. Good. We have our Canada. We have a big line going across. I don't know where that is. The big green line. All right, guys, perfect. It looks like a lot of you guys are in here. There's a, a yellow line at the bottom, not sure where that is. Maybe it's like New Orleans, looks like it's going through. We've got a blue line, a blue line in uh, Canada also. All right, guys, well, thanks wherever you guys are. Thanks for coming to, to spend your Wednesday night with us. I love doing this. I hope you guys enjoy it too. All right, so let's start from kind of the, we're gonna start from the bottom and kind of build our way up. So. With that being said, when we talk about joints, um, we talk about three kind of main causes here. And I'm gonna keep this as simple as I can for you guys. So um, things that um, are fibrous joints are generally um, fixed. They're, they're not, you can't really move them. So when we talk about fibrous joints, we talk about the um, articulations between um, bones and the, and the head. So that's something that we, um, that, that we call fibrous joints. The other one is, um, cartilaginous joints. So these are things like the, the vertebrae, um, the articulations between the vertebrae. And the one that is, is probably the, the, you know, maybe most famous and truly what we're going to talk about the most tonight is this, um, you, you know, synovial joints. And, and we know um, things that are synovial joints are free, freely movable. We know, you know, you guys can probably name a handful of synovial joints, um, you know, right off the top of your head. One is shown here, um, the hip, the knee. And we know, um, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more on a couple slides, synovial joints have synovial fluid inside. And we know that anywhere there's fluid, that can be, you know, a problem or it can be a, a source of infection or it can be a source of, um, you know, things building up in it, whether it's bacteria, um, crystals, whatever it may be. Um, not enough synovial fluid or breakdown of the, the membrane can, can be a problem as well. And, and we know that, that, that that's a problem in osteoarthritis. Um, we know that in rheumatoid arthritis, there's lots of um, cells and, uh, and immunological response that builds up that causes what we call a panis. So um, let's keep going here, but without a doubt, what we're gonna talk about the most today is synovial joints, okay? So that's a little background on this. So we start out and say, okay, three main types, synovial joints, and here's more classifications of synovial joints, and there's lots. And you guys might know this from your anatomy and physiology classes, I hope, um, if, you, if you've taken it, and if you haven't, that's perfectly fine too. Um, but there's lots of these joints um, and there's lots of, you know, examples for them. So we talk about um, gliding joints here and, and a big one for this of a gliding joint is our AC joint. So we know if you put your hand 
um, you know, at the articulation um, of your AC joint um, and your um, and your AC joint is your uh, acromioclavicular joint. We know um, that that is a gliding joint, you know, whether your um, arm is abducted or adducted or you're flexing or extending your arm, we know that that joint can glide. All right. Then another one um, is the hinge joint. So we commonly see that with joints like the elbow, the knee, where we see primarily these components of flexion and extension. All right, then pivot joints. Um, that's uh, one, one famous one is the, um, the atlas on the axis. So that's the articulation between uh, the, the cervical, um, cervical vertebrae in your neck. Then another one, um, this ellipsoid. Um, this is, uh, we see that primarily in the hand with uh, the bones in the hand. Um, where you know you kind of get this rotational component um not not a lot of, about that one um then we have saddle joints as well um and, and we know that the um the the first carpo metacarpal are, are saddle joints that's an example of it and then a ball and socket probably the most famous two are the shoulder um you know if you've ever seen anybody um dislocate their shoulder or their hip um that's essentially that ball getting out of the socket all right. So the, the common ones that we see um, are, are this one, kind of these pivot joints with the elbow. Um, and then we also see this here. So we see pathology in the pivot joint with the um, elbow, where you see kind of the nursemaid's elbow, where the, um, the part of the, uh, the bone slips out of the uh, cartilaginous or the, the tendon, essentially. And then um, these ball and socket joints when we talk about the hip and the shoulder. All right. So that's an introduction to that. Um, um, there, there's no questions on, on this, like, what joint is this? It's, you know, um, pretty, uh, it's just a classification thing more than anything. All right. So um, as, as promised, we're going to kind of emphasize the synovial structure. Um, and, and, you know, I don't know, actually, I tried to like decide what bone this was. I still don't know. Both these bones look the same size. I'm like, it, it's obviously just a cartoon, but I was like, mm, is this the knee? Don't know. Um, but nothing's really drawn to scale, obviously. But what we're going to focus on is this um, idea of we have a, a fibrous layer on the outside. The fibrous layer protects the, you, you know, kind of structure of the, the joint cavity. We have the joint cavity here, obviously. And then in yellow, what we see drawn is the synovial fluid. We know that the synovial fluid is, you know, it's not like water, it, uh, you know, has different uh, proteins in it that uh, allows the joint to actually glide. And that's important. It's important for integrity of the joint. It's important to prevent that bone on bone. Um, and it's Im important to, for the, the biomechanics of the body. We also have the synovial layer. Um, the synovial layer can get inflamed um, and, and can cause problems as well. So this is kind of the basic structure of the joint itself. Then when we talk about synovial fluid, so we're kind of going, you know, from the outside in basically, and, and the synovial fluid, we know that if we take the fluid, um, we that's called an arthrocentesis and if a, a patient has a problem with their uh joint fluid we can kind of discern what's going on based on what the the results tell us much like if we do you know um an lp a lumbar puncture and look at the spinal fluid might give us a kind of a differential to go off of um so normal what we kind of see is this transparent we don't really see a lot of white blood cells the culture should be negative we shouldn't see any organisms in it. We should see no crystals and it should be kind of a clear color. And then if we look kind of on the opposite side of the spectrum, something that is obviously septic and very kind of infected, we see that that's kind of cloudy. Um, it may still be a yellow color, but we see lots and lots of um, white blood cells. We see um, lots of neutrophils here, and then the culture is positive. Um, and, and, you know, examples of this is um, when we see septic arthritis. All right. Then other things like flammatory, inflammatory um, conditions can cause, you know, a, a little bit of um, white blood cells. We do see some neutrophils because it is an acute condition. Our neutrophils are usually first on the scene. 
we may see multiple and and things like gout um, is is what we see with crystals okay so that's kind of what that's pointing to and then um, in, in cases that are non-inflammatory, but we see, you know, still white blood cells, we still see a little bit of um, neutrophils are things like osteoarthritis um, or, or kind of long-term chronic degradation of the bone that's causing a uh, inflammatory reaction. So that's a little bit about the synovial fluid. Um, you know, you don't need to memorize this chart, but you do need to know if there is lots of white blood cells in the, um, in the synovial fluid, when we stick a needle in the knee or in the, any joint, uh, in the hip, in the elbow, wherever it is, if we stick a needle in it and we see lots of white blood cells and we have a culture positive, that tells us without a doubt there's an infection going on and we need to treat it before the patient becomes, you know, florally septic. All right, perfect. So let's clear that. Let's keep going here. And here's kind of a joint pain um, algorithm. And we're going to go through it very uh, kind of briefly here um, when we talk about um, uh, you know, obviously joint pain. So we kind of obviously get the history here at the beginning. Is it acute or chronic or, um, you know, is there inflammation? How many joints are involved? But um, the one thing that we're going to kind of, uh, you know, discern, we're going to be more on this side, obviously. We're going to, we're not going to, pay a lot of attention to these one these non-articular causes. Um, we're going to go here. And, and the first thing that we're going to do to delineate this pain is we're going to say, is it acute pain or is it chronic pain? And the way we kind of um, delineate those two things is by six weeks. That's our magic number here. We say six weeks. If it's less than six weeks, we say, okay, this might be acute. If it's you know greater than six weeks, we say, okay, this might be a chronic thing going on. So when we say acute, um, pain uh, less than six weeks. Okay, we might consider things like um, infectious, so sepsis, gout, pseudo gout, and reactive arthritis. Okay, and then this is kind of a you know a um, a curveball initial presentation of chronic. Uh, it's hard to discern. And then you know for chronic, we say okay, it's been going on greater than six weeks. Is there inflammation present? Is there morning stiffness? Because what that is doing for us is it's delineating between rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis. And then the other way we discern is because uh, or and obviously inflammatory versus non-inflammatory. But this is a big one that we look at too: is how many joints are involved? Because we know that if there's a lot of joints. Um, it could be something like reactive arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, um, things like that. Um, so this is just kind of a, a, you know, an introduction to see how much there really is to joint pain. Um, the, the main things that we're looking at is, is it acute and, or chronic? and how many joints are involved, okay? So kind of keep those things in mind when we're going through these, these cases here. Um, so I think I have one more slide before we go into the, um, the actual cases. And this is just to show you a couple things here. We're not gonna focus on the ANCA today. We are gonna focus on ANA. And for, for those of you that are um, you know, very smart and, and you come to all these sessions, um, what is ANA used for typically? Somebody out there tell me that. You guys know it, I know you do. Think autoimmune. Yeah, so it does have to do with, with lupus, Bridget, perfect. Um, and, and what we use it as is, is say somebody comes in with joint pain and we have a high suspicion of, um, of an autoimmune cause of this joint pain, whether it's rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, um, whatever it is, or we wanna discern between rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis. Um, we know that if there's a, um, a higher titer of a, or of the ANA anti-nuclear antibody that points us in the direction of autoimmune causes um, 
of, of serological pathology, okay? So this is a screening test, okay? It's very um, sensitive, but not specific, okay? Much in the same way that if we get a D-dimer test, it tells us, okay, there may, be a, there may be a clotting problem going on in the body, but it doesn't tell us where, okay? This is um, the same thing here. So it's, uh, it's sensitive, not specific. All right, then um, C-reactive protein and, and SED rate um, or ESR, this tells us inflammation, okay? Also very nonspecific. Um, rheumatoid factor, and um, which is, you know, sometimes inappropriately named. It's not that specific. It's not the most specific test for rheumatoid arthritis. That's our friend here, the anti-CCP. That's pretty specific for, um, for rheumatoid arthritis, RA. Um, and then we know getting a fluid aspiration, that's very helpful in a lot of cases for joint pain if we have an effusion or anything going on with the joints. And then we know uric acid, that may be a good way to, um, to, to look at joint or to look for gout, look for crystals in the fluid, but we're gonna talk about that as well, okay? So um, somebody out there, um, let's start with the first case here. Let's have somebody read it. It's a fairly short case. Um, don't be afraid. Um, and if you, you mispronounce anything, that's okay. Um, we'll, we'll learn it together. So somebody out there, go ahead. Everybody shy today or simultaneously prepping their turkey? I don't know. Probably both. I'll go, Emma. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> a 59-year-old male presents to his PCP with an acute onset of right great toe pain that started last night. The patient notes that he had just returned from vacation in Florida where he attended a surf and turf festival where he traveled by air and also enjoyed alcoholic beverages. No fever or chills. He takes hydrochlorothiazide for hypertension, but denies other medication. Physical exam as shown. Okay, so before I show you the physical exam, I want you guys to pull out your pointers, um, kind of that writing tool, um, it's under annotate, and underline the things of which you think are crucial or are important about this vignette, okay? Good. Good. Lots of good things. Good. Good. You guys are all on the right track. So somebody said traveled by air. Whoever said traveled by air, tell me why. I was hoping someone would point that out. Yeah, change in oxygen pressure, certainly. And what do we think about when somebody is, uh, you know, um, been immobile for a while, whether it's, you know, people in hospitals, um, people in long car rides, people, yeah, good, good, Madeline, DBT, excellent. And that's something that we want to think about. People who are immobile for long periods of time, we want to think about DBTs. Can DBTs cause joint pain? Yeah, certainly they can. All right. The one thing I want to um, also add here, um, I'll pull out my highlighter. Um, I want to highlight this. Um, yeah, somebody pointed out alcoholic beverages. Perfect. Um, so we want to look at that and we want to look at not really the turf, but well, actually the turf too, the surf and the turf. Um, so good. You guys uh, did great. Let me clear all this and let me show you the physical exam. I think you're on point with a lot of things um, in this case. So I know that you guys can pick out the, the, the most pertinent parts of the case, which is very, very important, especially when you're getting the, the history from the patient themselves, getting all this stuff and kind of discerning what is actually important. So great. All right, let me uh, show you this picture here. Here's his toe. He, uh, he said, um, I have toe pain. Um, this is what we're seeing. We're seeing, um, and you guys can write this in if you want for your, your physical exam, your objective findings. We see, um, we see erythema. We see, a, a, you know, uh, erythema is obviously redness. If you guys aren't um, aware, we see a little bit of swelling of the, um, the dorsal aspect of the foot. 
Um, but, you know, primarily, you know, maybe there's a little bit of an, an effusion here, but we see a little bit um, of, of swelling erythema here, which is obviously abnormal. So what tests do we want to order out there, guys? What do you guys want to order? Any ideas? So CBC, certainly. Adam, why do you want a CBC? I'm always gonna ask you why. Yeah, you wanna look at the white blood cells to see if there's an infection, right? Perfect. Anybody else? Think about what you wanna rule in or rule out. Katie says uric acid. I think that that is a good idea, but we're going to see um, here in a second that sometimes a uric acid is, it can be misleading. And we'll talk about that here in a second. So great, anything else? Think broad if you wanna rule in or rule out certain things. If we have a red, angry, swollen joint, yeah, we can get an x-ray certainly, um, because that you know can tell us if there's a, a bony problem, what may be going on, good. All right, um, if we have an effusion of the joint, what else? Yeah, some of you guys said, said MRI, sure. MRIs can, can tell us about ligamentous uh, problems, yeah, good job, Adam. That's what I was looking for. Um, we maybe we want to get an arthrocentesis. We're going to find out that in this specific case, um, we did get one, but um, it may, uh, you know, be a clinical diagnosis. So what are what are these? Is this abstract art? What do we see here? Somebody who's who's smart. What do we see? So we got the the fluid sample. We numbed up the foot. We went into the actual joint. Um, and then we looked at it under a, um, under a microscope, under polarized light, um, and we see this. We see negatively birefringent crystals uh, that are needle-shaped. So what's that? I think Katie knows. So we saw, uh, good, there, so yes, crystals, perfect. What else? Does anybody know what this is? What is your differential? You could keep the same differential too that you had before when you're saying, okay, let's order a, um, you know, let's order a CBC, let's order this. Let's, yeah, good job, Katie. Um, good. So she said, let's order a uric acid. That's excellent. And, and you, Katie is absolutely right. This is a case of gout. And if we look at things that are important in this case, knowing what we know now, we know that this was an acute onset in the right toe, we call that podagra, because um, everything has to have 77 names in medicine. He went to a surf and turf festival. Gout is known for um, red meat and seafood. Um, it used to be called long time ago, like a king's disease, because, you know, kings ate a lot of seafood and, and red meat and stuff, and they would get it in the middle of the night. It would wake them up in the middle of the night. Alcohol is also a culprit for that. Um, the travel by air was a decoy, um, but we do want to look at all of the details in the case. Um, hydrochlorothiazide, whoever pointed that out, excellent. One of the causes of um, increased uric acid is hydrochlorothiazide, a, a drug used to treat hypertension. So good. Let's talk a little bit more about gout. Good job with this one, guys. I think you guys pointed out a lot of uh, good things about this case. So here is what the pathology of gout is. Um, it is a, it, it's an accumulation of, of a, I'm sorry, uric acid in the joint, it's crystals. So um, it causes pain and inflammation in the synovial fluid, in the synovium. Okay, so um, risk factors for this, um, as we talked about red, red uh, meat, seafood, um, fructose, and alcohol. Okay, those are the, a lot of the ones that we just saw in this case. Um, other medications that can cause it, aspirin, um, thiazide diuretics, things um, like cyclosporin and tacrolimus. These are immunosuppressive drugs often used um, for transplant medicine. Um, ethambutol and uh, pyrazinamide, these are used for TB, you know, not commonly used in the United States, um, but those can cause increased uric acid. Um, niacin, vitamin B3 uh, can cause it, and then levodopa, um, a drug, uh, a neurodrug. Um, 
And then the other things, you know, for diagnosis. Okay, we, we, we said that we would talk about this uric, uric acid levels thing. The reality of this is this, if someone comes, comes to you with a, a red, hot, swollen, great toe, yes, you can get uh, uric acid levels, but often this is a clinical diagnosis. I just wanted to show you, you know, what it looks like for arthrocentesis, but the reality of it is you can diagnose this cl clinically. You don't need to do an arthrocentesis, but it is a cool pathology that we, we, we like to look at. Um, for uric acid, the, the reality of it is when we're getting a uric acid level, we're, we're checking the blood, right? We're not checking the joint specifically. So people of whom have gout can have low uric acid levels in their systemic system, in their, in their blood. Um, and people of whom have high uric acid levels don't necessarily get gout. So it can be misleading. Yes, we can get it and, and kind of see, um, you know, if it, you know, reaffirms our, our clinical suspicion, but it doesn't tell us a lot. All right. So other things that we can get is um, a, an x-ray. And then when we talk about the treatment of it, um, we, we say um, acutely we treat with things like NSAIDs, um, ibuprofen primarily, um, and then steroids and colchicine. And then when we talk about chronic treatment, we treat with uh, allopurinol, all right? Um, and that's to pre prevent another gouty attack. Um, and then here to the right, um, some of these words are probably ringing bells to you from your, um, your, your old uh, bio classes and chemistry classes. So what we see is our diet. So this is our, um, you know, our red meat, seafood and stuff, um, and, and nucleic acids in the body. They get broken down into purines, okay? Remember our, our, our friends, um, adenine and guanine, they get broken down into those, okay? And then they, uh, we know that they are broken down so that the kidney can excrete them. So it goes to hypoxanthine, uh, then xanthine, um, and then plasma uric acid. So we, yes, we can see that this, uh, you know, when this is high, because we're eating a lot of this, that this gets elevated. And then um, we, because we have a high uric acid, it gets deposited in the joint and correspondingly causes gout. All right. The drug allopurinol that's used for chronic treatment of gout, this inhibits the, um, the two uh, enzymes, xanthine oxidase. So what we, we see, if we inhibit these, um, these enzymes, we know that we'll get, you know, increased in purines and increase in, in hypoxanthine, which is, you know, fairly, you know, non, um, non harmful for the patient. So we don't get those uh, uric acid that deposited that deposits in the joint. Okay. There are other, um, there are other things um, that like, you know, for instance, uh, diuretics and, and low dose salicylates, that's what we just talked about, kind of inhibits the, the tubular secretion of um, uric acid. So it, it inhibits in a different way. Uh, Probenicid, another drug, and high dose salicylates uh, inhibit the tubular resorption. Um, but here, this, this image is kind of just pointing to this idea of, of allopurinol, um, how it, its mechanism of action, essentially. All right. Um, I, that is our first case. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to, to kind of throw them in the chat and we can, uh, we can definitely talk about them. Um, and I have one more slide here that kind of talks about um, gout versus pseudogout. You'll hear this idea of pseudogout. Um, and, and when we talk about pseudogout, um, obviously we learned that uh, gout is um, uric acid crystals are needle shaped and they're ne negatively birefringent, meaning when we have polarized light on it, um, it, it looks like this, it's negatively birefringent. Then the other thing is um, pseudogout. Um, in this, the, the composition is calcium pyrophosphate. We often abbreviate that CPP. Um, then they're usually um, rhomboid shape and, and you can kind of see them here, not a great image, but um, they're kind of that rhomboid shape and they're positively birefringent. So um, we know that um, when we put a polarized light on those, um, they uh, are, are usually a blue shape um, in, in, the, the po in the polarized light. All right, guys, so I think this is the last slide in this one. Yes, it is. All right, so I'm going to ask another person to read, and then we have one more case after this. Let's see if we can't uh, finish on time and, and go prep our turkeys. All right, so perfect. Okay.
Great. A 23 year old male presents to the ED um, with an acute onset of knee pain, which gradually worsened two days ago. He notes that he was camping over the weekend where he suffered a puncture wound to his left thigh, which he did not think anything of. He describes inability to move the left knee, fevers from 101 to 102.3 degrees Fahrenheit, nausea, and vomiting. All right, perfect. Thank you very much for reading. Um, those of you that are out there, pull out your pointers again. Uh, show me what's important in this case. What do we want to kind of point in on? And then others of you that um, are, are ready to answer the questions at the bottom, what questions do you want to ask this patient and, and what tests do you want to order? What were so, they you also, yeah, go ahead. What were they punctured by? Excellent. Good. Yes, I agree. We want to know what they're punctured by because we know metal is a little bit different than, than other things. Good. Anybody else? Inability to move the knee. Good. We have uh, um, fevers. Yeah, and those are actually high fevers. And, and something that you always have to ask is, okay, you had a fever. How high is it? And then you'll know that people will be like, oh, I had a fever of 99. And then you're like, wait, that's not a fever. So you, you do have to discern. You, you can't always take their word for it. Um, good. We see acute onset. We know that that's important. We see puncture wound. Good. We know that it's in the left thigh and now he can't move his knee. Um, what else, what, what questions do we want to ask or what do we want to order for this patient? We know that there's high fevers. Um, where's Adam? He, he had it right last time. Yeah, CBC again. Yeah, let's look at the white blood cells, um, you know, and, and see kind of what's going on with that. Good. Yeah, white blood cells. Excellent. Um, anything else you guys want to order? And what do you think is going on with this patient? And in the meantime, let me show you his exam. Good, yeah, he might, he might have an infectious process. Especially now looking at this exam, um, when we look at this, we see, you know, it, it's always good to compare one to the other. Um, and that's a nice thing about the body is you always have one to compare it against um, whenever you're looking at the knee. Never look at one, uh, you know, body part in isolation, no matter where it is. Um, you know, if you're looking at an elbow, compare it to the other one, obviously. All right, so um, we see here the left knee, um, it's erythematous, um, you know, it's swollen too. That can kind of tell us, you know, whether the, we're, we're looking at a, um, you know, a cellulitis. That's definitely on our differential too, um, because we see an erythematous knee. You know, we definitely want to rule in or rule out cellulitis, um, which is, is important. And then, because, you know, the, the treatment may be different based on the bugs. So uh, we see that's a little bit swollen. Um, so let me give you a, I actually may have given it to you in the next slide. I'm not sure, but here, I'll give you the white blood cell count. Let's call the white blood cells 14.3. All right. High, low, normal. What do you guys think? Yeah, that's high, good. So that might reaffirm your idea of an infection, right? Um, does anybody want to get an x-ray of this? And what do you think is going on with this patient? Does anybody have ideas other than infection? I agree. So we got another um, another joint fluid, and this is what we saw. So we remember when we do a gram stain, when we see high white blood cells with um, when we have fractures and stuff, you can. That's a great question. I'm glad you asked it because um, you know a high white blood cell count you know doesn't necessarily mean anything. I can go out tomorrow and, and you know get a, another COVID shot, and my white blood cell count's going to go up. It tells you about inflammation. Um, and, and some people have a you know a transiently high white blood cell count for reasons we don't know why. All right, so that's a that's an excellent question. I'm glad you asked it. 
Um, and, and, and in this case, what we see is we get the fluid um, and, and we stain it, okay? And we're doing what we call a gram stain and, and we delineate it by gram positive. Remember our gram positive friends, they have a very thick um, cell wall with a, the lipotechoic acid. And then we have our friends, the gram negatives. And what we see here um, is because um, you know, we, we see, um, you know, because these uh, organisms have a high, a high um, cell wall, a big cell wall, it's retaining that um, stain, that, um, that right GIMSA stain. So these are gram positive, um, and, and what we classify them is how they're kind of together or not. Um, we know that strep is kind of in chains, and we know that staph is in clusters. They, they kind of look like clusters of grapes, essentially, and that's what we're seeing here. Um, so this might point us in the direction of, of staph. Um, and we would do additional biochemical tests, as we kind of talked about in our infectious disease um, talk many, many uh, lectures ago now. Um, but we might think of something like septic arthritis. Um, so I hope that you guys uh, kind of saw that by some of these things here, especially kind of this fever, can't really move the, the knee, nausea, vomiting. That's not typical of our, um, typical of our, you know, normal joint pain or rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis joint pain or anything like that. A uh, puncture wound, um, whoever pointed that out, great job, because if we, we know that if it's, um, you know, metal, that can cause tetanus, and we want to vaccinate against it, too. But the reality of it is we'd probably give a tetanus shot anyhow for this. So, so here's our, our um, remember, um, what did the, what did we talk about before in terms of white blood cells? What is this pointing you in the direction of? And we see gram positive coxine clusters, as I kind of indicated before. Yeah, septic, exactly. And inflammation. Um, Varsha, you're absolutely right. And we see that this is um, septic arthritis. Now let's talk a little bit about septic arthritis. We see septic arthritis for a number of reasons. And we know that it's not just bacteria, okay? We can have bacterial, viral, we can have fungal. Um, due to penetrating wounds, we see it sometimes with animal and dog bites. And, and I should have added human bites in here and that sounds crazy. And you're like, who's going out biting people? But like it happens. And the most common cause we see it is on Nights like tonight where people get in bar fights and they uh, hit somebody's, um, you know, tooth and it's not necessarily a bite, but their hand and their skin has come in contact with the teeth um, and that causes a wound that we have to prophylax against. We give um, what we call augmentin. It's a moxicillin clavulanate that protects against um, certain bacteria like Echinella. Um, and then artificial joints and hardware can also become infected as well. All right. Um, risk factors that we look at, we look at things like age um, and, and comorbidities. Um, and, and you hear that word a lot. What does it mean? It means that sometimes your uh, immune system may be um, not equipped to fight these infections. Um, bacteremia certainly can cause it. Um, and IV drug abuse. And that's what this uh, gentleman right here has going for him is... Um, because of IV drug abuse, we often see that um, AC joint um, becoming infected. Um, so we can see it in lots of different areas, um, lots of different joints. There's tons of joints um, to be infected. Um, but the, this, the sternoclavicular joint here um, becoming infected is, is definitely um, an, an IV drug abu abuse problem. Um, the way we diagnose it, this is an instance where we do need um, uh, to do an um, arthrocentesis. What we do is we look at the cell count. We see, you know, is there predominantly white blood cells, red blood cells? Um, is there neutrophils? What are the, are, is there lymphocytes in there? Um, because if it's lymphocytes, that might point us in the direction of things like tuberculosis. Um, but if there's, you know, more neutrophils, we might say it's probably a bacterial cause. We're going to get a gram stain and we can do th things like an x-ray and MRI, but you're going to see these patients, they're super sick. They're, they, they look, um, they look septic um, and you have to act fast so that they don't get septic, um, like florally septic. Um, and we treat this um, with antibiotics. Sometimes what we do is um, the, the surgeons will do, take them to the OR and do irrigation and drainage of that uh, synovium. 
um, but definitely antibiotics. You're going to be um, you're going to be given antibiotics before they even go to the OR. That's an option for them. Okay. So good job with this case. This one's fairly simple, um, but this is one that you don't want to miss. All right. Um, and let me know if you guys have questions. Here is the last case. Um, let's get one more person to read here. Do I just start reading? Yeah, you can definitely start um, reading. Sure. A 33 year old female with a PMH significant for Hashimoto's thyroiditis presents for a long standing history of joint pain. She knows fatigue as well as the joint, as well as, well as joint point, primarily in the hands, wrists, and knees bilaterally. The pain is worse with activity, and when she first wakes up in the AM with stiffness, that lasts nearly an hour. Physical exam is shown to the left. So I don't know. I, I, I guess I was thinking like Dr. Seuss or something. I put joint pain, but it should definitely say joint pain. Thank you for reading, by the way. Um, I must have not had enough coffee when I made these slides. Um, but that should say joint pain um, as well as fatigue. So pull out your um, pointers again, guys, and, and, and underline for me what you think is important from this. And let's try to be very specific and, and underline only the most important things. Good. I think you guys are on track and you're being very specific, which is great. So that AM, that morning stiffness, very important, okay? Um, because what we see, we, de we delineate osteoarthritis um, from other things by how long that stiffness lasts in the morning, okay? We see um, whoever underlined the Hashimoto's thyroiditis, tell me why you think that that's important. And good job with the bilateral, the, the uh, laterality of the pain. Why do you guys uh, think that the Hashimoto's is important? Uh, maybe specific types of um, arthritis are correlative with Hashimoto's. Good, yes. And what we're thinking, yeah, good job, Madeline. You took the words right out of my mouth. You guys both together kind of answered um, the question. And that's that, you know, autoimmune things you know, run in, in, in packs because you have one, doesn't make you more susceptible to the other, but if you have one autoimmune thing, that means there could be a possibility that you have kind of these HLA genes, these HLA haplotypes for autoimmune things. So good job. Longstanding, she has fatigue. So she has systemic causes of, of um, you know, of a joint pain manifestation. Um, they're bilateral, it's worse with activity, it's worse in the morning, and then the, it lasts about an hour, okay? So let me show you the physical exam now that we've kind of discerned what's important here. Let me get rid of all that. Here is her um, exam. Somebody tell me what is going on here. Is this a normal exam? Let's start there. Edema? Yeah, I think there is edema there. I would agree with you because we, we can't really see the, the you know, a, a lot of kind of the delineations of her knuckles. And we can see it kind of really on the dorsum of her hand too. I would say that that's edema kind of in this area. Good. I don't see any erythema. Her fingers are bending. Which way? So we know that the ulna is here. Um, and then the radius is here. Okay, so if you guys were to call this something, what would you call it? Deviation which way? Towards which bone? Towards the ulna or the radius? Good, excellent. 
Yeah, good job, Madeline. And you called it exactly what it is. It's called ulnar deviation. And what we see is when they hold the hands out, it usually deviates towards the ulna. And it's not because they're, um, you know, abducting the wrists, because you'll see her wrist is normal. It's truly just the, um, the actual finger joints deviating the other way, okay? So good. We see some ulnar deviation. We see some edema. You guys are absolutely right. Good job. Um, let's see what else we have here. What labs do you guys want? Remember one test that I taught you about before as a screening test. a and &A, good job, excellent. X-ray, I absolutely want an X-ray too. Good, so here's your X-ray. And what lab test do you guys think? Here's your X-ray. And I'll tell you what, it took me a long time to find an X-ray that matched up with this image. It, it was probably the, the most time intensive thing that I did for this, this presentation. Good, yeah, I want a WBC count too and an X-ray. You guys are on, on, um, on track. And we have a one vote for arthritis, excellent. Good. So we see ulnar deviation. Um, we see, you know, perhaps a little bit of inflammation kind of in the, um, the, the carpal metacarpal joints, um, certainly. Um, so you guys say WBC, you guys say ANA. All right, here you go. Here's some nonspecific tests. We have an elevated, um, we have an elevated ESR and we see a um, elevated CRP. So that tells us what? What it tells us what's going on. Remember, it's non-specific, but it tells us there's some sort of process going on in the body. Inflammation. Excellent. Yes, it tells us there's inflammation. Good. Here's your serology. What do you guys think? Yeah, good job. Madeline, the other Madeline, there's like Madeline squared here tonight. Madeline T and I don't know the other Madeline's last name, but we have Madeline squared. Um, so here you go. Here's your, your rheumatoid factor. It's positive. Um, your ANA is positive and your anti-CCP is positive. What do you guys think is going on with this patient? Excellent. Yeah, we, we have uh, votes for rheumatoid. Excellent. You guys, you guys got it. Good. Um, so we know the ulnar deviation is pretty characteristic. Um, the, the one thing from the history that I want to point out is this idea of um, stiffness lasting uh, more than an hour. We know with osteoarthritis, which usually is in older people, and it's because of degradation of the bone in the joint space, that lasts usually less than 30 minutes, usually less than an hour. Um, with bilateral, that kind of points us in the direction of maybe something going on um, systemically, especially with the fatigue and the autoimmune. So those are all pretty characteristic things. And then, you know, the, the getting the serology is kind of a, a grand slam there, if you will. So let's talk about rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and and uh, oop, there we go. So let me clear this. Good. So um, the etiology, we know that this is autoimmune, you know, much as we kind of suspected kind of with that history. It's polyarticular, meaning multiple joints. And then, you know, the, the joint space gets kind of um, destruction because of these autoantibodies. And what we see here on the right is this panis formation. We kind of talked about this. And this is a pretty complex um, uh, thing going on, but it's in this joint space. And we see multiple different um, interleukins kind of acting here. We see the IL-6 that's usually caught the cause for inflammation. Um, we see uh, TNF, you know, it's usually TNF alpha um, and interleukin one beta. We see that here as well. But what we see is because of this, um, you know, we see T cells and B cells, you know, releasing and activating these cytokines that acts on macrophages um, to cause inflammation here. Um, then we see um, the macrophages because of them being activated can activate B cells of which are plasma cells to release autoantibodies. Um, then because of the systemic uh, inflammation going on, we see neutrophils at the scene um, and we see lots of a, a multi, multifactorial inflammation going on. And that's pretty characteristic here. We see lots of inflammation, lots of de destruction and degradation of the joint space. 
this picture down at the bottom is very, um, you know, it, it is ulnar deviation, yes, but it's pretty um, severe. Um, you see pretty bad ulnar deviation. And um, I encourage you guys to Google it. You'll see lots of very severe manifestations on Google, um, lots of knuckles, um, lots of, um, or you'll, you'll see inflammation of kind of the knuckles, you'll see lots of deformities, things like that, um, and severe rheumatoid arthritis. It's a pretty uh, debilitating disease. Um, this is like most autoimmune things, women get it most commonly more than men. Um, we see it in middle-aged women too. So our, our, our lady was a little bit younger, 33 years old, um, we see autoimmune and family history, like we saw the, the patient had Hashimoto's thyroiditis kind of points us in the direction. And then the other two curious things are um, obesity and smoking, but we see the common link is that um, inflammation component. All right. Um, if you guys have any questions, throw them in the chat. Um, let's keep going here. And I'm going to just talk about osteoarthritis versus rheumatoid arthritis just briefly um, with talking about um, rheumatoid arthritis first. So we see this um, first, this morning stiffness lasting more than 30 minutes. Okay, we had that. We see the inflamed synovium. We call that the panis. Um, and we know it's autoimmune. Okay. We see our extra articular involvement. We saw that we saw fatigue, um, you know, systemic, uh, symptoms like that, but we also see the symmetrical involvement. We saw it bilateral in our patient, which pointed us in the direction of this, because when we look at something like, um, when we look at something like, uh, you know, osteoarthritis, it's asymmetrical. We see cartilage loss um, here, and it's it's a uh, usually um, because of degradation of the bone, bones, um, it's uh, or the joint space. It's a degenerative disease, in other words. Um, and then we see that morning stiffness lasting less than thirty minutes. And there's other manifestations of it. Um, we're not going to get into that, like herbian's nodes and stuff like that. But um, let's clear that. I think this is my last slide. Um, well, one more. Uh, so the, the last thing that we're going to talk about is these long charts, but that's all to say rheumatoid arthritis is most commonly treated by methotrexate. Okay. That's what I want you to remember. Um, because when we, we think, uh, you know, rheumatoid arthritis, methotrexate and lupus hydroxychloroquine. But that's what I want you to remember here, methotrexate. That's usually the first line treatment for it. And you're gonna hear tons of commercials um, you know, about biologics, um, things like Humira, Humira, that's a monoclonal antibody, um, pretty effective for it. And then Infliximab, that's a uh, Remicade is the, the brand name for that. You'll, you'll probably hear, li listen to, you know, the TV commercials, you'll probably hear lots of things about it. But all the biologics, um, you'll remember them by um, this ending in MAB, which is monoclonal antibody, okay? Um, and, 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 these are all anti-TNF. Um, there's obviously other ones that, that act in an, another um, one by different, um, you know, inhibiting different interleukins. But these all act on anti-TNF because if you remember back to the Tapanis formation, it was because TNF-alpha was activating everything and, and just going crazy. So if we inhibit TNF-alpha, if they're TNF-alpha, anti-TNF-alpha, then we're reducing some of that inflammation. So it makes sense, right? If we know the pathology behind it, Choosing the treatment is easier, okay? Um, but what I want you to remember is, yes, there's lots of drugs to treat this. Um, methotrexate is often first line, okay? Then the biologics are, are, you know, a little bit down the line. All right, then we have this classification criteria, um, you know, yes, uh, you know, multiple joints. Um, obviously there's a point score associated with this. This is less common. This is, I just want you to see kind of all the, um, different manifestations. Yes, if there's multiple joints, you get a higher score. Serology, if you have a positive rheumatoid factor and um, ACPA, the anti-CCP, it's higher. Obviously, that points us in the direction. Um, and if you see like a high CRP and ESR, that gives you some more points too. And if you have a chronic duration of symptoms. So all those things that we talked about before, you know, the multiple joints, the in inflammation going on, the serology, that all points us in the direction of, um, you know, of rheumatoid arthritis in general. All right, so let's keep going here. Um, and that's my last slide. And I think I, I just barely ended on time. So